Welcome to the Movie Spoiler Club, the channel where you can watch movie, television, and streaming series within minutes. Today we're going to spoil the movie Eagle Eye, 2004. This movie story plot is about Jerry Shaw, Chia Labayouf, and Rachel Holloman. Michelle Monaghan are two strangers whose lives are suddenly thrown into turmoil by a mysterious woman they have never met, threatening their lives and family. The Unseen Caller uses everyday technology to control their actions and push them into increasing danger. As events escalate, Jerry and Rachel become the country's most wanted fugitives, and they must figure out what is happening to them. The sun beats down on a foreign desert landscape, as the camera follows two boys playing a game of chase. In the distance, three cars can be seen barreling down a dirt road. As the scene settles in, it's clear that there is some kind of military mission taking place. There are soldiers perched in the hills with their weapons raised. When the cars reach the village, people are seen scurrying off with their children and loved ones. In the U.S. military base, helicopter descends from the piercing blue sky and lands on the dusty ground. From the military radios, the armed forces are trying to get a clean match on the target. The man they are searching for only appears once every few years. They might not get another shot. The technology software confirms that the target is only a 51 1% match, a score that flimsy raises concern among all the soldiers and officers pacing in the control room. The decision to strike is left to one man, and he decides they have to act now, even if they aren't 100% positive that it's their target. A drone soars in, a missile is launched, and the target is destroyed. Through the flames, Eagle Eye flashes across the screen. Three men sit casually at a table in a dimly lit storage room playing a friendly game of poker. Each man hopes they have the cards to take the pot. One man, Jerry convinces the other to sweeten the pot by filling his head full of fantasies with his girlfriend. The man throws more cash onto the table and lays his cards down. Jerry smirks confidently and reveals his hand. The winner takes all. Their game is interrupted by another person. Break time is over. Time to get back to work at the copy cabana. After his shift at work, Jerry takes the subway home. He slinks back to his apartment quietly as to not disturb his landlord. She senses his presence and tries to get him to pay his rent. Their interaction isn't unpleasant despite the serious subject. Their conversation is interrupted by Jerry's cell phone. His mother is calling. Jerry answers the phone, and in moments he is on the floor in the dark. Jerry receives bad news that his twin brother Ethan has died. Jerry returns home for the service. Back home. Jerry sits alone in his old bedroom processing and grieving the loss of his dear brother. His father walks in. The two have nothing but cold empty stares and sharp words to exchange. When his father reaches for his wallet to give something to Jerry, he stops him. Later, on the subway home, Jerry finds a check rolled up in a side pocket of his bag for $1,000. Next, the story introduces two new characters, Rachel and Sam. They are running late for something, and Rachel can't find her car keys. Once they are set to go, they bolt for the subway station in a hurry. At the station, Rachel says goodbye warmly to her son, while trying to contain her frustration with Sam's father. Sam is going on a school trip to Washington, D.C. He plays the trumpet, and his class will be performing for the president. Sam will be going all by himself with his friends and teacher. When Sam boards the train, the parents head their separate ways. The boy's luggage sits in a pile with the other bags. When a man talking on his cell phone stops to confirm the trumpet case is there, whoever he is speaking with tells him to grab the case. The next morning, Jerry goes to the ATM to deposit the check into his bank account. When he inserts the check, the ATM notifies that he has an available $750,000 in funds. The ATM spits $20 bills out like some kind of miraculous malfunction. Jerry gathers all the bills as many as he can and flees the scene. Startled by what just happened, he returns to his apartment in a hurry. There he finds his elderly landlord coming out from his apartment, complaining that he has had so many deliveries today that she had to store them somewhere. Jerry brushes her away and pays her enough rent to secure this month rental and the next. Inside his apartment, he can see the mess of boxes that are stacked everywhere. Confused, Jerry begins to slice open the tape. Inside the boxes, he finds various items like passports with his name, military-grade weapons, bullets, and other disconcerting packages. His cell phone rings. When he answers to the unknown caller, the voice on the other end immediately starts giving instructions to him that he has to leave the apartment if he wants to live. This voice knows down to the second of how much time Jerry has to act and obey. When Jerry resists and time runs out, 
The FBI crashes through his apartment and arrests him. Jerry is held under arrest. And being interrogated by Agent Thomas Morgan for his attempted acts of terrorism, Rachel is at a bar with a couple of friends, enjoying possibly the first girl's night in years. She is about to make her move on a guy when her cell phone rings. She sees a picture of her son on the screen, and her eyes light up as she steps outside to take his call. When she answers, the voice on the other end is not her son. The same voice that called Jerry is calling Rachel too. The voice instructs her to steal a car if she doesn't want her son to die. Rachel hangs up and tries to call the police, but the phone call is intercepted, and the voice threats that she must obey if she wants to keep her son safe. Back at the FBI building, Jerry is desperately trying to convince Agent Morgan that he is being framed. Jerry is left by himself for a while until an officer allows him to make a phone call. Jerry picks up the phone to reach out for help but the voice is waiting for him on the other end. When he puts the phone to his ear, the voice robotically instructs him to get on the floor quickly. He has four seconds. Jerry sees a crane arm losing control. He falls to the floor as the arm swings through the glass and crashes into the building. This is his chance to escape. From 13 stories up, Jerry must jump. Why? Because that's what the electric signs are telling him to do. Jerry follows every instruction given until he finds himself on a train. Alone and petrified, he takes his time to process the moments that led to this. The stranger across the aisle is asleep. His phone begins to ring and the screen lights up with text. Answer now Jerry. Jerry grabs the phone without waking the man and answers. The voice instructs him to stay on the train for the next three stops. Jerry tries to sneak off, but the voice manages to hack every passenger's phone. When everyone answers and hears the same message, they all go after Jerry. While the train switches its direction and begins to roll backward. When the doors open, Jerry bolts out of the train. He runs so fast that he almost gets hit by a car. He opens the passenger side and gets in. He shouts to the driver to drive away, but when he turns to look, the driver is Rachel. Together they drive while they are both uncertain of who each other is. She thinks Jerry has her son, and Jerry thinks she is the voice causing all this trouble. They continue to drive, then suddenly the voice transmits through the car's GPS system. The voice commands every turn. The directions lead them to Pier 15. While police cars are in hot pursuit, the voice seems to be helping them get away. But they can't be certain if they can trust this AI. A crane claw picks up their car and dangles them high above mountains of metal. They both have to jump if they don't want to die. They jump out the windshield of the car and land on garbage ferry. The car gets dropped into the bay. On the garbage ferry, the two strangers try to figure out what the heck is going on. Jerry is beginning to wonder what exactly was his brother involved in. And if that has anything to do with the current events, they await for their next instructions. Meanwhile, at an instrument repair shop, the man who stole the case is now following instructions from a cell phone. He is planting something inside the instrument. Another man at a jewelry store is cutting and sizing a diamond that received from a delivered parcel. According to specific instructions, he has created a beautiful diamond necklace. Unknowingly that a material is not a diamond but an explosive substance. Once off the ferry, Jerry and Rachel must walk along a dusty road. Then a van pulls off the road. The driver leaps out and starts asking questions and complains that he can't do it anymore. He throws the car keys on the ground and starts walking down the road in the direction he came. The cell phone rings and Jerry answers. The voice instructs him to stop the man or he will die. Jerry tries to stop the man but an electrical power cord comes crashing down. It electrocutes the man into charred pieces. Then Rachel and Jerry take the van to their next destination according to the instruction. Once they arrive, the voice informs them that they must rob a man and steal his briefcase. Rachel doesn't think she can do it, but together they work as a team to follow all the instructions. The robbery doesn't go exactly as planned. Alarms are sounded and the two must run away before they get caught. The two push through the crowded streets of New York and find a tour bus with open doors that come to pick them up. They board and find a seat. They settle in for a long ride. And that's when they notice this briefcase has a timer. Meanwhile, Zoe Perez of the Armed Forces is trying to figure out the strange incident circling the death of Ethan Shaw, Jerry's brother. She does a little digging and finds some interesting information. She begins talking with Agent William Bowman who was close with Ethan. Bowman introduces Perez to their technology called Area. This advanced piece of AI technology is able to hack every electronic device on the planet in order to prevent threats and keeping laws and orders. The bus arrives at an airport where they are instructed to board a flight. Once through security, 
Jerry and Agent Morgan catch each other's stare. Jerry alerts Rachel and they run away. Morgan manages to keep up with them and chasing them through the airport. Jerry and Rachel slip into the baggage warehouse. Morgan follows them there. They slip and slide through the chutes of baggage belts. From there, Jerry and Rachel dash onto the cargo entrance of the military plane. Just as the doors begin to close, inside the briefcase are serums to keep their body's temperature normal. While they are inside the plane's cargo, when the plane lands at the destination, Jerry and Rachel are led to Area's panel. Jerry is instructed to undo the orders his twin brother enacted on Area. That's why the AI needs Jerry in the first place. When he complies, Rachel is instructed to murder Jerry. Rachel refuses. She is then instructed to get into a car with a middle-aged man. Jerry is captured and detained. Agent Morgan has been alerted that something bigger is at work. He frees Jerry from detainment and the two share a car. Jerry tries to explain everything while Aria is working to destroy their communication. The car flips by a missile from a drone and Agent Morgan is severely injured. He hands Jerry his gun and badge. Jerry takes it and gets into another car and heads for the Kennedy Center. Rachel arrives with the man and he gives her a change of clothes. Rachel changes her outfit and is seen putting on the diamond necklace from earlier. She is led to her seat. Perez and Bowman work to disarm Aria. As seats are filling in the theater in Washington, D.C., the President of the United States is giving his speech. While Aria is uploading to offline satellites, the trigger is in Sam's trumpet. The detonator is in the diamond around his mother's neck. Aria battles Bowman and Perez until Perez finds a metal stake and stabs it directly into Aria's spherical orbit head. The president announces to the audience to welcome the orchestra, and Rachel realizes that her son is there at the event too. She begins to make her way toward her son. The band begins to play the national anthem as Jerry enters the room dressed fully in police uniform. In order to stop this incident, Jerry raises his gun in the air and fires a warning shot. The orchestra halts and is rushed inside. People scurry in a panic. The orchestra was interrupted before Sam could play the final note that would kill him and everyone else inside the hall. Security agent shoots Jerry in defense of the president. Jerry falls onto the floor while everyone rushes to safety. In the following weeks, Harry is decommissioned, and Jerry receives a medal of acknowledgement and honor for his acts of service. After making a full recovery, Jerry returns to his normal life. Rachel is throwing a party for her son. There's a knock on the door. Sam runs to open and finds Jerry with a birthday present. Rachel thanks Jerry for remembering her son's birthday. She smiles admiringly and plants a kiss on his cheek. Could this be love? Movie Trivia Do you know that Shia Labbeyev stated that? An FBI agent told him and the cast during filming that one in every five phone calls someone makes is recorded. To prove this, the agent had him listen to a phone call he made two years prior to filming. This movie gets the movie rating of 6.6 .6 from IMDb, to Matometer rating of 26 and audience score of 62 from Rot Tomatoes. Thank you for watching and be sure to hit like, subscribe, share your thoughts in the comment section, and hit the notification bell for the new movie spoiler video every week.